Uh, I'm Bill Mayer. I'm the uh, former chairman of the Aspen Institute and we're currently still a, a trustee. And I'm delighted to welcome you, our listening audience on Aspen uh, Public Radio and our viewers on Grassroots TV. I want to thank Tom and uh, Bonnie McCloskey for sponsoring the McCloskey Speaker Series. We've had a great summer and we look forward to many more years of the Speaker Series. Uh, what you're looking up here with the three of us is, uh, is family. And uh, it's not that we all grew up in the same household, but uh, the interlinking between us. I've known Peter Reiling, the Executive Vice President for all of our leadership programs and seminars at the Aspen Institute for 20 years. I was on his board of directors and on his executive committee when he was the chief executive of a company called TechnoServe. And we were driving in northwest Ghana in probably 1999. Something like that. When I convinced him to take what we call here the uh, Aspen Executive se Seminar. He took it. He changed the way he thinks. And when we started the uh, Henry Crown program, Peter was in the second class of Henry Crown Fellows. And as part of his community project, he started the leadership programs we have in Africa. We now have over 12 leadership programs with 1,000 fellows from 54 countries literally all over the world. So it's quite a remarkable achievement. And what Peter is doing, I think, is as much a passion of life as it is a job. And to his right is, of course, Jacqueline Novogratz, our speaker today. I met Jacqueline here in Aspen about six years ago, sat next to her at lunch at the Meadows, had uh, not known her at all. We started talking. Turned out she was a new Henry Crown Fellow and uh, was nice enough to ask me to be her mentor. So I was fortunate enough to be a mentor to both Peter and Jacqueline. And part of my other life is I'm still the uh, chairman of the Board of Overseers of the Henry Crown Program. So that's why I decided we're family. I won't spend any more time introducing Jacqueline except to say that she currently joined the board of the Aspen Institute. I'm a member of her board and Peter as well as a member of our board here. So Peter, go ahead. Thanks, Bill. And welcome to everybody, and, and Tom and Bonnie, thank you again so much for supporting this series. Maybe we should start by talking about Bill Mayer's way to do it. I think so. <laughs> Bill, thank you. Um, Jacqueline, uh, I wanted to start out um, by asking you this. Uh, you and I correspond by email an awful lot, and every time I send you an email, uh, you're either in Pakistan or in India, or you're in East Africa, you're all over the place. Where on earth did you get the time to write this book, and, and what prompted you to put the time into doing it? Um, you can always count on Peter to ask the question that you least expected. Um, there are two answers to it because I actually started writing the book in 1996 when I didn't have any time then either. But um, I, had, I had left my job in banking in the early 80s to start an organization that was connect. Well, I'm going to skip all that. Just my recent thing. You'll find out later that I, I, I run an organization called Acumen Fund and, and probably do work nonstop. Um, but I'm an incredible insomniac and um, did a lot of the writing of the book um, between 2 and 4 in the morning, probably, and um, on weekends. It's the short answer. All right, that's a good short answer. And why the name? It's called The Blue Sweater. I hope everybody's seen it. And uh, Jacqueline will actually be signing uh, books afterwards. We'll have some time after this uh, uh, discussion. Um, the blue sweater, because so much of the book is about interconnectedness, and it's the, the, the title of a story that occurred to me um, starting when I was about 10 years old, and my favorite uncle, my Uncle Ed, gave me a blue sweater that had zebras running across the front and Mount Kilimanjaro right across the chest. And I loved it so much that I wore it all the time, including into my freshman year of high school when my adolescent curves were filling out the contours of the, certainly the mountains, um, <laughs> differently. And so um, I've said this many times, but I really do believe that there is a 
a precise moment in an adolescent girl's life of complete and utter mortification. And mine was one day in my freshman year of high school when my high school nemesis yelled across the hall where the football players were all standing that the boys didn't have to go skiing on the mountains anymore, they could just use my sweater. And um, <laughs> I thought I was going to die a thousand deaths, ran home. My mother and I ceremoniously dropped this sweater into the goodwill and I thought I would never have to see it again um, and berated my mother for letting me wear this horrible rag ever. Um, and I forgot about it until 10 years later when I was jogging through the hills of Kigali, Rwanda and lo and behold I see 10 meters in front of me a little 10 year old spindly boy with toothpick legs wearing my sweater and um, I, being a frenetic type, I ran up to the child, grabbed him by the neck, turned the collar, and my name was written on the tag of that sweater. And so it was one of those, if not a life-changing moment, a moment of uh, revelation that I was certainly in the place I was supposed to be and that in truth we are all interconnected and that our action and our inaction can impact people we might never meet or never know all around the world every day of our lives. For those of you who haven't read the book, I, I really do recommend it. it. It does a really remarkable job, I think, of showing what almost seems like the inevitability of the creation of the Acumen Fund. And I wanted to take some time this afternoon to sort of retrace some of those steps. So you started out your career as a banker with Chase Manhattan Bank, right? And you ended up in doing some work for them in Brazil. And I think it was there in Brazil that you suddenly decided maybe this isn't where your passion is. Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I mean, part of me loved banking. I loved this idea of using money to invest in dreamy-eyed entrepreneurs that um, were building businesses that created jobs. But I was working during the Latin American debt crisis of the early 1980s. 82, 83, 84, uh, mostly in Latin America. And so my experience was of writing off hundreds of millions of dollars of loans often made to elites that almost immediately upon getting receipt of the loans were sending the money into the Cayman Islands or somewhere offshore. And yet recognizing that low-income people weren't even able to go into the doors of the banks. And I would spend the weekends kind of wandering through the favelas uh, seeing all the vibrancy in the life there and decided that maybe it would be a really good strategy for the bank to start lending to lower income people that maybe um, not only, and I told this to my boss, that Chase should start a program where we lent to uh, middle class and, and upper lower class people because we'd probably get our money back and we would be doing a really good thing, good thing for the country. And um, he literally about a week later gave me a book called The Innocent Anthropologist um, and said, you know, you might be wanting to do something else. And I really felt like this was something Chase should do. Um, ironically, and this is where as you get older and see how movements occur, 20 some odd years later, almost all of the major banks in the world have a micro lending component of the work that they do and certainly community lending. But it was too early then. Too early. A visionary coming too early with the idea. So you decided to leave Chase Manhattan and you decided to go to work for a microfinance organization. Yeah. And um, you, they sent you to initially to Cote d'Ivoire, if I'm not mistaken, but you had to go by way of Kenya, right? Tell us how that worked. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, obviously, and I found this group that was working with um, microfinance. And the first thing, that they wanted me to do was go to a women's conference in Kenya to introduce myself. And it was this incredible experience because I was still dressed like a Wall Street banker, but I felt like I was in this butterfly convention of just women dressed in these beautiful colors, everyone dancing, incredible strength. Um, but not really aware until I met them the next morning that they did not want me to be the representative, which was the job that I was taking in the Cote d'Ivoire. Um, certainly not the West African women. Uh, they felt that I was, I was white, I was American, I was too young, I was not married, I had no children, I didn't know French very well, and I certainly didn't know Africa. There was not a, a single qualification 
that they could see in me that would bring any credibility to this really plum job because I, I was given a fancy office in the um, African Development Bank. And so um, the women collectively made it known in no uncertain terms that they didn't want me to be um, taking this job. I had, in a completely cavalier way, left Chase. Um, I had been offered by the COO of, the, of Chase um, because despite my idealistic tendencies, I was actually productive. And so they, he had given me this big job offer um, that my parents thought was a lifetime opportunity. And uh, I had told him that I, I couldn't take it because I had to go save you know, the world, uh, starting with the African continent. And, um, and there, uh, within my first 48 hours, I was rejected from the continent. <laughs> so it was a quick wake-up call for me. But you didn't, you finally made it to Cote so you went to Kenya, you made it to Cote I went to Kenya and, the, and the, the, the leader of the organization in New York said, let's just wait and, and, and people will, it will become fine. We'll just keep to the plan, people will decide that they like you. But we didn't really do anything proactively to make that happen. And I just kept thinking if I willed it enough it would happen. So then I arrived in the Ivory Coast and again was met on this steamy hot day, you know, 110 degrees. And at that point, now the, the Abidjan um, airport is, is quite nice. But then, I only had two boxes of possessions to my name at the time, and of course a guitar. But the, um, the, the guys ripped open my box with knives and threw all my belongings <laughs> on the ground. And I finally make it through customs, and these three women said, you know, we don't want you. And that was the entrance to... Uh, welcome. That was my welcome <laughs> to the Ivory Coast. So you ended up, in fact, going back to Kenya, right? And then you started traveling into Rwanda. Do I have that timeline yeah. right? And uh, tell us about your initial forays into Rwanda. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I didn't go immediately back. I stayed for about four and a half months in Abidjan um, until this crazy voodoo and poisoning experience, which is a whole other story. Well, let's um, <laughs> um, where I kept being told by the women, you know, they, they don't want you. In part, again, it was all based on the beauty and the status of this office, which you, want, you get more than anybody. Um, and so I was told, you know, don't eat food in front of anybody, ever. And uh, I was wasting away. I weighed like 12 pounds, and um, and and then I ended up and and that and at night, if you feel hands around your neck, get a crucifix <laughs> because the voodoo gods are afraid of Jesus. Um, and so, even though you think that that would never happen, you, in the middle of the night, you do start thinking, "Is <laughs> something happening around my neck?" So it was a very intense experience um, when I left. And so I left um, feeling, one, like a failure, and two, um, like, um, uh, and two with a lot of humility, that if I was going to stay in Africa, and because I, I couldn't face going back to the COO of Chase Manhattan Bank to say, in five months I've, I've failed at everything I've tried to do. Um, I decided that if I was going to do something next, one, I would have to be asked by Africans themselves. Two, I would have to really understand the terms of what was expected. And three, I would have to be really clear about what I was getting out of it. And that this paradigm that I had gone of, I'm here to help you, could not be the only terms upon which the deal was settled. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that was the experience that allowed me to be open when three Rwandan women walked into my office in Nairobi one day and said, um, our country has just changed um, its policy, its family policy. We've abolished Napoleonic Code. Um, Napoleonic Code was used in many of the West African countries, certainly the French colonial countries, and it said that women could were essentially put in the same category as children and the mentally incapable, and therefore could, had very few um, opportunities that they themselves independently could pursue. 
including opening a bank account or getting a loan, and this was all changing. So it was this historic, exciting moment. Two of the women were parliamentarians, and they were two of the three first parliamentarians in a parliament of 60. And um, would you come to our country and would you um, spend about three weeks doing a feasibility study of what it would take to build a bank for women? And I immediately said yes, and I think a part of me knew that I was not leaving until we had built that bank, but that's what. Did you build it? And we built it. And so you built that bank, and then one of your clients that I, I think I have this right, that you talk about in this book, is the famous Blue Bakery. Yes. Tell us about the Blue Bakery. Well, it wasn't actually a client. It was, um, we started lending in the market, and one of the the things that you see in microfinance, we still see it today, and it's an issue with microfinance today, is that most of the businesses that we were lending to employed one, two, at most three people, usually a woman and then her two kids. And so I thought there had to be ways of creating businesses that actually employed people. And so I started asking around, um, who knows of a, of a business that actually employs people that we could invest in um, so that I could learn and um, nobody had any ideas until one day my friend, who I call Onorata in the book, said, well, you know, there's this blue bakery in Yamarambo, which is, I mean, not blue bakery, there's this bakery in Yamarambo, which is a, a popular quarter of Kigali. And um, it's an interesting project, but it's, it's, it's run by 20 prostitutes. Um, and I thought, well, you know, you've got to start somewhere, let's go. Now I remember it. <laughs> I couldn't place it before, okay. And so I really didn't know what to expect, but we drive up and I go in and there are, it's, it's kind of in a hovel of a house, and inside are two long wooden benches in the front room and these 20 women sitting in gingham, green gingham smock dresses like this. And I was thinking, okay, you know, this is, this is, the, this is what we're, we're dealing with. And um, as it turned out, the women were single mothers. And so I learned very quickly the power of language and, and how we use it to make others little and insignificant and marginalized. But also that this wasn't a business at all. That it was a well-intended charity that are, is like so, many, are like so many other charities in that some donor had this idea that they would create a bakery for these 20 marginalized women um, and ended up spending about $600 a month to keep 20 of them making about 50 cents a day, um, living in real poverty, but able to, to dance around and make these cakes when the donor would come and everybody would smile and maybe sing a song together, and it was a farce. And it, it, it made me really angry, as it continues to make me angry when I see so much of this happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I said to the women, look, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, I will help you. I'll build this business with you as long as it's no longer charity and we get rid of that and we live and die by our profits. And I don't really think the women understood the deal they were making, but they agreed. And, um, and I certainly didn't think that I was going to, to start another business while we were starting the bank, but it felt like the only thing I could do. And the Blue Bakery ended up doing quite well, right? Yes. Linda, you would be proud. We cornered the snack food market in Kigali. <laughs> It was not without its bumps in the roads. You know, at the beginning I was really nice and the women started stealing blindly from the bakery. And, um, and then I got really tough, uh, which was really about mutual accountability. What I learned later was that they were testing me and I actually passed that test. And we went, we got to a point where they were making between two and three dollars a day, which was at the time two to three times, the, the national um, average was a dollar a day. People, the, the average income was $112 a year in Rwanda at the time. So suddenly these women had economic resources and suddenly I saw how dignity is so much more important to the human spirit than wealth, that they were able to say no for the first time in their lives. And it was incredible. And we were quite famous in Kigali because there were no snack foods. And, and we went from making little waffles and samosas, and I can't cook a thing in my life. Um, so I take no credit for the culinary aspects of this, but they went into banana chips and cassava chips and potato chips and any kind of chip that could be made, we made. 
um, peanut butter, and, uh, to wa and the women would walk into these little stores throughout Kigali and see the products that they had made and packaged, and it was incredible. So tell, tell us a bit about what you learned from the Blue Bakery that then informed what you do today. Well, the first I just said, which is this, the, the, the power of dignity, and I think that when we talk about bit poverty, we too often uh, quantify it in, in only economic terms. And what it means to be a full human being has as much to do with our desire to be seen, to be known, to have choice, to have opportunity, as it does to have money and things. Um, that's not to say that income isn't a vital part of it and that people don't use income, but in some ways, it goes back to the Aspen Institute in Good Society, it's income as means to something else. And it takes a very little bit of money combined with choice and opportunity to equal a lot of happiness. And so that was the biggest lesson. Two is that um, we talk all the time about give a man a fish or um, teach him how to fish. But what we miss is that a lot of people know how to fish. But they don't have access to markets. And certainly marginalized people don't have access to markets. And many people don't know how to market. And so if, you, if we can use our privilege to connect those extraordinary individuals who now know how to build things, know how to make things, and help them both market to other markets, but also find those markets, which was essentially what I was doing on a little, a little kid kind of way, you know, knocking on the ambassador's doors so that suddenly we had clients. We, every day, these women would go out in their green gingham smocks with buckets filled of donuts because there were no real snack stores or there was no culture of that. And they would go into the offices of the UN and all of the fancy offices and deliver them. But they themselves wouldn't have had a lot of credibility knocking on the door and saying, we have a bakery service for you. I could do that. And so that was a second big lesson for me. And the third was, of course, um, confirming my assumption that traditional charity does not work, but that this mix, that this wasn't a pure market play, mm -hmm. that if you incorporated my time and the, the value of my time um, alone in, in terms of the training that was being given to those women, um, this wouldn't have been viable. But with some subsidy for that, we could create a viable businesses business over time. So as small scale a project as it was, it has had a lot of impact in terms of what Acumen does and how we do it. So you, of course, learned other things from Rwanda because you were there during the horrors of 1994 and the, and the genocide. And you mentioned the Aspen Institute and things we talk about here. And we spend a lot of time, as you know, in our fellowship programs, asking ourselves what our view is of human nature. So I wanted to ask you, having lived through what you did in Rwanda, how did that imp impact your view of human nature? Um, I, I, not surprisingly, have always felt that we are good, that we are deeply good. Um, but I also feel, and certainly after going through genocide and watching friends and colleagues with whom I worked for many years, um, commit acts of genocide. Um, I also had to integrate and recognize that there's, there's angels and monsters that coexist inside every one of us. And that um, our job as leaders, our job as those who have access to being part of constructing good societies, need to find ways of building systems that, that pull out those angels and suppress those monsters. Because I think that we all deeply want to be good, but we all know how to be bad. And, and it's that tension that actually makes life quite wonderful and interesting in, in an ironic way it can also go, go very much awry. There's a very powerful moment in your book um, where there's a woman named Lilian, right? And she's, she, had been, she had to evacuate her home right, during the genocide, and then came back and the home had a squatter in it, and the squatter was one of the soldiers, is that right? right. One of the perpetrators right. of the genocide. No, so he, was a, he, was a, he was from the, he was a, a, a soldier from the RPF. 
And so he had taken over the home, right? And so you talk in your book about learning about forgiveness and how incredible, how incredibly forgiving the people of Rwanda were in the wake of everything that they had to live through. Talk a bit about that. Yeah, and are. Um, it's funny, I just got an email from her this morning. Um, she has an ex in incredible story even as a bystander. She delivered twins um, in the middle of the genocide. Her husband's a doctor. Um, both Hutu, so the Hutus were the killers of the, of the Tutsis. And, um, and her twins were born about seven weeks prematurely, so they weighed about a pound and a half, two pounds each. And um, one died the next morning, but the other one, they had, a, they had access to an incubator. And so they took this incubator and kept the baby wrapped through the genocide, which, and just the visual of seeing all of these bodies, but they were doing everything to protect one life, mm -hmm. was so extraordinary. And, and so she came back to the, when she came back after two years of living in the refugee camps, she came back with extraordinary guilt um, that she was a bystander, even though she also lost probably 60 or 70 members of her family, um, both, both in the genocide, but also in the, um, the, the, the coming back of people, many, many people were killed during that. And, um, and so when she went to this house, there was a soldier there and she was very frightened and her girlfriend also found out that um, there was a soldier living in her house and when she went to go tell the soldier that this was her own house, the, the soldier uh, killed her on the spot with a machete. So it made the stakes even higher for Lillian to confront him. But she um, knew that this house was the only thing that she and her husband had owned. They had worked for it. They continued paying for it throughout the times that they were in the refugee camps and had almost paid the mortgage off. And, um, and Paul Kagame, the president, was really trying to repatriate the houses and, get, and, and put an end to all of the soldiers just taking over the civilians' homes. And so she knew that the, the law was on her side. Um, when she finally convinced him, and it took her about three years um, to leave, and he left it just a stinking mess, um, he moved f just down the block. And his children ended up being best friends with her children. And they had to interact with each other. And not only did he f she forgive him um, and take care of his children, but she, in her little three-bedroom house in which her two children, her husband, herself, her sister and her sister's family all lived. She kept one room aside um, for a little chapel to thank God daily for the blessings that she had in her life. And you see that over and over and over. People, I have a friend who lost 103 members of her 106-member family. And um, when you talk to, to Jeanne d'Arc, all she talks about is how blessed she feels, and um, the power of love. And so you, it makes you want to be a better person when you get to have friends like that. Amen. You came back from Rwanda, if I have this right, and you came back and you got yourself an MBA at Stanford. Yeah. Right? And then you ended up working with the Rockefeller Foundation. And you had a couple of mentors there. Is that right? So you had uh, Peter Goldmark and you had John Gardner mm -hmm. as your mentors. What did you learn from your mentors that have helped you along this path? Um, John was um, the, the most important mentor in my life, and he, um, so important that he died in 2002, but I feel like I have a conversation with him every single day, even now. Um, the, he, was, he was incredible at um, s creating profundities and sharing them in very simple ways. And so he would, I remember once I was given this really fancy job opportunity and um, John kind of listened to it and he, he thought it would be really great for status and prestige and all that kind of wealth and stuff. But he said, you know, Jacqueline, it's better to be interested than interesting. Um, so I was like, so you don't think I should take it? And um, he said, no, you know, you do whatever you think you need to do. But there's this other opportunity where you could really continue to live in the world in a very curious way and um, pursue those things that you love. Um, he would say things like, uh, 
if you really want to be free, commit something, yourself to something to, bigger than yourself. And he had a way of pushing you that was both loving but also very forceful. And in fact, one of his other favorite sayings was, sometimes you just have to push the inevitable. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think, what would John do uh, all the time? Peter was much more about be unafraid, go for the, the, the biggest things. Think about what are the ultimata that the world is facing, and it is up to you personally to go and try to fix them. And it was that unabashed uh, joy at taking on the biggest projects possible that, that I think Peter infused me with, and he still does. Um, he spoke to our Acumen Fellows uh, last year, and it was fun to watch him with that same unbridled energy. So you, you had another mentor at the Rockefeller Foundation, and that was Gordon Conway, right? And he, he, he was critical in giving you the time to think through and develop the concept for Acumen. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I, I had gotten really frustrated with traditional um, philanthropy. I had found it highly unaccountable. Um, I, I found it too much about feeling good rather than really focusing on what's working. Not enough talk about what's, what our failures are and how we're learning from our failures. And so, and it was in the middle of the dot-com explosion where the private sector was changing in such exciting ways. And I thought it was time for me to go back to the private sector. And so I told him that I was going to do that. And he said, you can't waste 20 years of building a platform of learning um, to just abdicate. Instead of going to this place that you now see as really shiny, why don't you take this moment to reinvent philanthropy and what it should look like? And the gift he gave me was six months, which I ended up calling my mucking around period, which is um, a six month period where I just talked to all the smart people I could find in the world and threw spaghetti against walls, um, had informal focus groups, and came up with the idea of Acumen Fund, which in, fun, in a funny way was always brewing inside of me, but needed to be pressure tested um, and made better by many people that I feel lucky to know. You, you just talked, touched on something, which was your, your uh, discontent with traditional philanthropy. I would gather in this room here today, we have lots of people who are involved with philanthropy. What sort of advice do you have for people who are involved or thinking of getting involved in philanthropy to address global poverty? Um, the, the first piece is, the first piece is to um, know clearly the problem that you're trying to solve. That, and, and connected to that is when you're looking at a leader in whom you're thinking of investing, make sure that they know clearly the problem they're try, trying to solve. Because one of the things I find most often is that people say, well, I really care about the environment. But what does that really mean? Um, what problems are you trying to solve in environment? And when you talk to leaders of organizations, their mission might be, you know, we want to make the world a safer place. Well, that's a very big uh, mission plan to create a work plan around. Um, show me. In a, in, a, in a more focused way what it is that you're trying to do and then how you intend to show me that you're actually getting there or not getting there. The second is um, we don't build businesses with, um, at, certainly at the beginning, we don't build businesses with very small donations that are focused on one specific program area. We build them by focusing on um, by, by bringing in investment capital to allow an entrepreneur to build the business that they're trying to build. And we need more of that in philanthropy. We need more general operating money um, to allow entrepreneurs to actually build organizations um, over time. And I think that that's another big piece. And the third is get involved. Don't just, just be passive, but know what it is that you're, that you're, you're doing. And create a, a conversation that's open enough that the leader or the entrepreneur, the, the president, feels confident in telling you what's not working so that you can help them fix it. Because too often, I think, the power dynamic that occurs is that 
we don't tell each other the truth because I, as um, CEO, want to make sure you're happy. Um, but I certainly have learned through Acumen Fund that people really appreciate when you talk about what's not working because then you're, it's a show of respect. Probably just as the women at the bakery wanted to make sure you were happy in the beginning rather That's than right. hearing what the challenges were. That's right. So you're, you're, you're very clear in the book about your impatience with traditional philanthropy, but you also talk about foreign aid and that you're impatient with that. And this is really what led you into Acumen. Talk about that. Well, it's the same, it's the same principles with foreign aid. Um, I, I, I was, 10 days ago I was in Pakistan and I had a long conversation with Ann Patterson, the ambassador, who's just wonderful. And, um, and she's there, we've been talking about Acumen Fund and whether we would ever take foreign aid because the United States has just committed another $1.5 billion a year to Pakistan. And I said, Ann, we, we gave $11 billion since 2001 to Pakistan, and I'm not seeing a lot of progress. In fact, I've seen the, the, the resurgence of the Taliban, um, increasing levels of poverty, a widen, widening gap between rich and poor in a very frightening way. And in terms of the U.S. brand, you can't even imagine what it's like to get into the embassy. Um, it's, well, you can imagine. It, you have to go through five or six guards and leave your passport and your, well, essentially your life um, at the front door just to get in. And the young woman who's just brilliant and wonderful, probably 33 years old, married, um, who, I had, who, I, who escorted me to meet the ambassador, um, said, you're so lucky you get to go all over the country. I've only left the compound three times mm -hmm. in the last four months. And I thought, this is not Americans interacting with Pakistan. And so when I, when I, when I had a long talk with her, we talked, and I think that there are no secrets about what's wrong with aid. It, it tends to be top down. It tends to go through governments, um, which leads to a lack of accountability. Um, it tends to be run through very well-intentioned um, civil servants who aren't necessarily builders. So they're not investing in ways that actually help people build companies and organizations. Um, and certainly in countries like Pakistan where there's not a lot of trust, it tends to go to what's um, in, informally known as the Beltway Bandits, Inter uh, U.S. agencies that are very good at coming into countries and, um, and building uh, projects but then leaving. And so they don't have that long-term rootedness in country. And sometimes they're, they're forced to use U.S. suppliers rather than Pakistani suppliers or whatever country, pick your country. And I think it's, I think it's changing. And certainly my conversation with Ambassador Patterson felt to me like there's a real desire for that change. But certainly for Acumen Fund, it's very clear to me, you know, what what some of the pieces are that would need to be put in place for us to interact with aid. Um, I really believe that there are extraordinary entrepreneurs in every country that are building systems for their own people um, in ways that often put them at risk. We should be investing them in them. We should be partnering them. We should bring in, help, help bring in the management assistance that makes them better and stronger. And then we should be celebrating them in a really great way. Um, that creates brand and partnership that's real. That's not, we've just built this well for you and here's the helping hands. That doesn't create brand. Mm -hmm. um, real relationship, real partnership. And one of the things that's been so thrilling and exciting in Acumen Fund and, um, and when we work in a country, it's really important to me that we raise money in a country because we're, when there's no longer the developing world and all the people are poor and the, the developed world where all the people are rich. We are one world and we all have elements and Katrina showed us that we have elements of the developing world in the United States and wealthy Pakistanis and wealthy Indians and wealthy Kenyans are as wealthy as wealthy Americans. And so we raise money from the wealthy Pakistanis. And um, when I was just there, we had a, a book reading and community event, and about 350 Pakistanis came. 
And it was so exciting to see the pride and the, um, the determination to make things work because they were investing in their young Pakistanis. And they were uh, amazed that these young people who have Harvard MBAs have come back to work with low-income farmers to try to figure out how to make drip irrigation work so that those farmers can change their lives. And that's where I think America has a unique opportunity that we, um, we haven't taken full advantage of yet. You know, I realize we're, we're this far into this discussion and I haven't asked the question. So in your elevator pitch, how do you describe the Acumen Fund? So we're probably throwing around the name, the Acumen Fund here, and there's probably lots of people in the room who don't, unbelievably enough, know about it. So, so what is it? And, and everything that is built up in this book is saying is really about the inevitability of creating an organization that builds on all the lessons you learned. Tell us what the Acumen Fund is and why it's different. So, so Acumen is built on the, those three building blocks that, that markets alone will not solve problems of poverty, that traditional aid alone will not solve problems of poverty, that we need them both if we are going to solve problems of poverty, but that dignity is more important to the spirit than wealth. And so what Acumen Fund does is raise charitable money, but instead of giving it away, we invest loans and equity in uh, companies and nonprofits in the developing world. Our focus areas are South Asia, and East Africa, Pakistan, India, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Um, entrepreneurs that are bringing basic services to low income people healthcare, housing, water, alternative energy. Um, and uh, the, what we hope to see are models that were a laboratory of models for what it takes to bring affordable basic services to low-income people so that they can access them and so that they can have choice and opportunity to change their own lives. And what's been so extraordinary is that we've invested about 40 million dollars um, over the last few years. We'll be nine years old next April. And we've seen tens of millions of people now have access to services We've seen over 25,000 jobs created, good jobs, and in many ways, and maybe more important ways, we've seen models that are starting to be replicated, um, as well as the sector changing, where more and more traditional philanthropies are thinking of themselves not just as donors, but as investors that really want to see change and are willing to work all along the, the way to make that change happen. So between us, I would guess we've spent five decades trying to convince people to invest in places like Africa. And I know that you hear the same thing that I hear, which is, it's so corrupt. How do you address this issue of corruption? There's a great quote in your book from uh, Mary in Nairobi. She says, is corruption the cause of poverty or is poverty the cause of corruption? What's your take on it? And how do you respond? Um, corruption exists and at Acumen Fund, well, too often people think that government is the only place that corruption happens. But corruption is everywhere. And some of the more painful things that have happened at Acumen Fund over the last year is discovering corruption in three or four of our enterprises where we've had to take real action. Um, in one case, not making an investment that we were very close to making. And in two cases, actually, moving out of the, of the investment. And what's so, um, the, what makes it all the more painful is one of them is a real success story in Africa. And there are other social investors that made the decision to stay in this particular um, investment. But if I've learned anything, it's that corruption hurts the poor a lot more than it hurts the wealthy. And so we have a really hard line on corruption. Um, We've taken a few, so we have a zero tolerance policy. Um, the idea of patient capital, which is at the core of what Acumen Fund do, does, this idea that, that if you invest uh, capital, but you allow it to stay in an enterprise for a much longer time than a normal investor would, and you combine it with a lot of management experience and assistance, you can find ways to, to to figure out a lot of the solutions to these problems. That that also means you can allow entrepreneurs to take longer 
to get access to licenses and registration because that's a lot of where the petty corruption happens. There's big corruption that happens in big government contracts, but the real er eroding, the, the fabric eroding corruption happens in the, I want my kid to get into your school, here's mm -hmm. 10 bucks. Um, we have a funny story with a, one of our fellows, Javad Aslam, was helping to build a housing development in Pakistan. And to register the land was an incredible nightmare. And he kept telling me, the registrar won't register it unless we pay him a bribe. Why don't we just pay him a bribe? And I said, well, we don't pay bribes. So, but in my mind, I had this, this picture of this huge brute of a man. And um, when I finally met the registrar, he was a 31-year-old pipsqueak of a guy, one-armed. I mean, I could have taken him, like, in four minutes. <laughs> and, um, but he was fierce because his way of earning income, because he doesn't make any money from the government, was to insist on registration fees, and Javad wouldn't pay. And um, finally, he, he just wore the guy down, and we finally did the whole thing legally. And then when he had this last, like, he had to pay for, like, some stamps, and it was about $8, the equivalent of $8, and so he gave him 10. And um, the guy wouldn't give him his J.H. <laughs> and, <laughs> He just needed something. And um, Javad got in a big fight, so I had, it was a leadership moment for me to talk about sometimes there are battles you just let go. Um, but <laughs> so we, we do it by just doing it. Um, my hope is, and this is one of the reasons that I, I really think it's important for Acumen Fund and funds like it to get large, is that the more visible we are, uh, in all the countries in which we work, the more th this anti-corruption orientation becomes considered the way that business should be done. And my optimism comes from seeing many young entrepreneurs that are just sick of seeing the bribery game and refuse to play it. And so finding those like-minded souls becomes really, really important. And this is where Crown and AGLN comes in. So we have a entrepreneur named Shafi Mather who started an ambulance company in India and the ambulance system around the world but certainly in India is completely corrupt you cannot get an ambulance unless you bribe someone and so um, and in Bombay the the system is so broken that despite the fact that 17 million people live in the city until 1298 came along there were only 70 working ambulances none of which had the necessary metal, medical equipment that we would expect and so Shafi, after almost losing his mother, he comes from a wealthy uh, Indian family, decided he was going to create a better ambulance system. And so the, the, the model is built on no corruption, a sliding scale pricing system, because the ethos is service for all. So if you're taken to a hospital, you pay. If you're taken to a free public clinic, it's free. And, and, and a lot of the revenues come, because he's a great marketer, from advertising corporations on the side of these bright yellow taxis. And um, he's had a lot of threats to his life. Uh, police have stopped the ambulances on the way to hospital to try to get bribes at that point. Mm -hmm. And they have let the, ambulance, the, the, hospital, the police uh, follow them, and then they've taken the police to court. I mean, they're really out. But what happened was in the um, terrorist attacks in Bombay last November, um, the first responder, and in many ways the only responder, was 1298 ambulances. And for me, being in New York at the time, watching CNN coverage of it, the only ambulances I saw were these bright yellow 1298 ambulances. And we'd only started this company with 1298 a year before that. And it was that moment of, oh my God, you know, you really can change systems. You really can. Mm -hmm. The Indians saw that as well. And in fact, they got 125 people out of the, uh, of the hotels while the terrorists were in the hotel. So you talk about brave young guys, no bulletproof vests, just pulled these people out and saved their lives. Um, that changed the whole game for 1298, and they've now um, turned into a private-public partnership. They've, sold, they've won contracts in four states across India and are starting to... The, the, they're on their way to becoming the biggest ambulance company in India, um, which is a really big deal. And um, 
their anti-corruption piece also now encouraged a small group of 20-something lawyers that took a big charity um, uh, ambulance company to the Supreme Court um, on charges of fraud and corruption. And it was discovered that $750 million in contracts were given without any legal tender system. And so those were put back on. So it's slow, but we're changing. And just because there's corruption does not mean we shouldn't go work, because that's how we're going to make it the change. You know, we started about 10 minutes late, so I'm assuming we got about uh, uh, 13 minutes to go, if that's okay with everybody. And I wanted to give people an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to ask uh, one or two more, but if anyone does have questions, we have microphones on either side. Jacqueline, I want to uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, you and I are both Henry Crown Fellows, and I'm now running the Henry Crown Fellowship Program. Uh, can you talk a bit about how your experience at the Aspen Institute with this fellowship program has impacted your leadership, if at all? Oh, I think on, on many, many levels. The whole notion of, of, of the way we think about the Good Society and what it means and the choices that we have as a society and the trade-offs, for instance, between um, the individual and community efficiency and equality, liberty, and um, so that when, when not only do we use the way that the Crown Fellows um, are taught in our fellows program, but, and Peter actually teaches them twice a year. Three times. Yeah. Three times a year. So spends a good, good chunk of time with the fellows. But also, um, when we teach them, for instance, we have a water company that now is bringing low-cost water to rural villagers. But outside the village, and, and is doing a remarkable job, but outside the village are the untouchable castes that aren't allowed to live in the village. They would be willing to pay the same price for that water, but they can't afford the transportation costs. And so the Good Society framework allows you to ask them, so what's society's responsibility? The market can go this far, but if our goal is equality as well as efficiency, is there a role for smart subsidy? So it's helped frame the conversations in much more compelling and important ways. Good. Are there any questions from anyone in the audience? Yes, please. Jumped right up at the microphone. Um, I guess I'll just ask. Um, in terms of what we can do as individuals, those who do not have the resources to set up philanthropic uh, organizations and, and, and travel abroad and do those kinds of things, um, uh, what, what can we do as individuals who don't have the resources of, say, not philanthropic organizations? How, how can we make a difference and, and have an impact? Um, well, the first is to learn and to get more engaged in what's happening around the world because there's so many exciting and interesting things that are going on. Um, and when we think about an issue that, like water, uh, it's a really complex issue. And so to get a better understanding of what's going on. The second is to and this is where the internet is so powerful, is to join groups that are having these kinds of conversations and that are looking for solutions. There's a young professionals group that is started in New York and they get together to learn about the issues that we're working on and one of the things that they've decided to do was have a, a, a photographic convention where they would uh, auction off photographs and they raised $25,000 on their first night. Um, so exciting to see. We didn't do a thing. And so I think that there are also ways of building groups that um, are about supporting an organization that is doing this work. One of our fellows started a book club in one of the slums of Nairobi um, because he'd given my book to a guy who had a third grade education and was um, at this public toilet that we also are, have an investment in. And I got this beautiful letter from this man who had read the book and really connected with many of the characters in the book. He's HIV positive, he's unemployed, but feels really ambitious and wants real opportunity. And so starting a book club with people that don't necessarily get to think about these ideas. But it's really finding what you're passionate about, learning about it, and getting connected to organizations that are doing that kind of work. We need 
all of these organizations, and there's so many around the world, um, need you. Other questions? Yes. I have a perception, and it may be inaccurate, that property rights and legal systems are often a problem in some of the countries that you're working in, like most of those countries. But you talk about all these projects as companies. Are we wrong to think of it as a company the way we think of a company that's owned by people? Or how does that work when the public press seems to indicate that property rights and legal systems have a way to go in these countries? Um, no, you're, they're, they're, these are real, registered, private uh, companies that we hope to take some of them public. Um, in fact, um, and there, it's an ex there's an extraordinary array of these kinds of companies, the ambulance company being one example, where these entrepreneurs may end up making money out of this public service that they're providing. And what starts bending the mind about how the world is changing is that people are now donating ambulances to this private company because they see that this company will really make it work, whereas some of the organizations to which they've given them before were failing. So these are real companies um, that, if they're profitable, and some are profitable, pay taxes. But their clientele, for the most part, makes one and two and three dollars a day. I mean, in some ways, maybe one of the most extreme examples is a company, is a nonprofit called Jami Bora. And it's located in the uh, Kibera slum and the Mathari Valley slum outside of Nairobi. And it's connected to, it, it's been working for about 11 years with rag pickers, prostitutes, really the poorest of the poor in Nairobi. And it decided that um, one of the biggest things was that poor people get stuck in slums um, forever. And when you look at these slums, they were started in 1915, and many people have lived in the same house that they rent, typically from mafia guys, for 30, 40, 50 years. And so no banks are going to lend to them. It's not microfinance, because the houses cost about $4,000. And people, philanthropists often say, well, once you're making 4 or $5 a day, you're too wealthy for us, because we want to help the poorest of the poor. So what's the way that we actually get people to move out of slums? And so they decided to create a for-profit housing development company. And we put in half, a quarter of a million dollars uh, loan to this company. And I went, because so many people had said to me, well, Acumen's not working with really poor people because um, you're supporting this for-profit housing development company. And so I went back into the Mathari slum to see uh, who these customers were. And my favorite person that I met was a woman named Jane, and she was very beautiful, about 32 years old, and kind of reminded me of Audrey Hepburn. And I asked her what her story was. And she was living in this slum where you literally had to walk through raw sewage. And it's famous for what's called the flying toilets, where because there are no accessible latrines, people defecate inside their homes on paper and then they throw it. Um, now you imagine living there for 50 years and, you, and the alleys are literally like this, this wide. And so, um, but you meet people with just such grace and such com composure. And so I asked Jane what her story was and she said that she had, um, when she was a little girl, she really wanted to be a doctor when she grew up. But her mom was a single mom and couldn't afford to send her to school. And so her other dream was to marry a really good man. And so she did when she turned 18. By the time she was 20, she had two babies, and the guy le left her. And so she um, didn't know what to do. She was in the slum. She had a third grade education. She became a prostitute. She did it for about seven years. And in 2001, she hated her life, felt very ashamed. She heard about Jami Bora, the nonprofit, and she wanted to get a loan. To get a $50 loan at that time, you had to raise $50 yourself. It took her a year to save up that much money, but she did. And um, she bought a sewing machine. 
And then this is where it gets connected to the blue sweater because she ends up going to the very same market where my blue sweater probably went through and buys ball gowns that have been discarded by people like us and end up in this African market. And she repurposes them for First Holy Communion dresses and Sweet Sixteen dresses because she gets that really low-income women want their daughters to feel like princesses too. And so I said, I want to watch you sell those dresses. And I've wa wandered in the streets with her. And she's a hawker. That's how she sells it. And the women come by, and she negotiates the dresses. And uh, it took her seven years, but she saved the $400 to put a down payment on this house that she's about to move into. Now she's moved in. It's about an hour outside of uh, Nairobi. And I said, so what's happened to your dreams? And she said, you know, in some ways, my dreams don't look like they did when I was a little girl, but in other ways, they've all come true. She said, because when I was little, I, I, I dreamed that I would marry a good man, but what I really wanted was a loving family. And I have three children, and I love them fiercely, and they love me back. And she said, and I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but what I really wanted to do was heal and serve. And in 2001, I also found out that I was HIV positive. And, um, but I've been on antiretrovirals ever since. And I feel so blessed that I'm so healthy and I've done so well in my life that twice a week I volunteer and I talk to HIV patients and I tell them, you are not dead. And because you are not dead, it is your duty to heal and to serve and to give to others. And she said, so maybe I'm not a doctor because doctors, they give out pills. But maybe I'm better, because me, I give out hope. And you, um, and you listen to a woman like Jane, and you think, we have got to redefine, again, what we think about poverty and how we think about investing in those places that are too often forgotten, because we put boxes around them. And they're either too rich or too poor or too corrupt, but instead, Look, at, look and find where the human spirit is dying to thrive and can thrive if just given a little bit more potted soil. But with that right balance of accountability and love. One of my favorite quotes is from um, Martin Luther King who says that love without power is anemic and sentimental and that power without love is reckless and abusive. And I think that if there is any quote that embodies certainly what I've learned in my life through Rwanda and genocide and the, everything at Acumen, it's that we need to have the courage to walk through the world holding boldly both love and power and working from that place. Thanks. Tom and Bonnie McCloskey, you've been so generous to the community for this speaker series. Thank you all.